Hi, Deb. Hi, how are you? Good. I think I only hear you through Tom's uh, speaker in the other room. Can you hear me now? Now you're on. Excellent. Hello. This may be our first professional engagement together. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Yeah. You are being paid for this, just to be clear. I am? Yeah, there's a fee. I mean, just know I would do it for you for free, so. I When I said fee, I meant... I pay you. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> there's a coffee in this fee. How's the movie going? It's, Wes told me that the feedback from the screening was good. People laughed. And yeah. I mean, I think we we have some ideas uh, um, of things that don't work, and we're still trying to figure some stuff out. But for the most part, I think it's really quite good and was mostly successful. Mm. So, And if you say that, then it really must be very excellent. <laughs> I mean, I do like it. I think it's a, I think it's a good movie. I think it's really fun and wow. tight I mean, and clever. So, you know. Yay. Yeah. Darling, we're getting our money back. <laughs> I believe it when I see it. I hope so. I feel like, no, I feel quite strongly we're getting our money back. I feel like, I feel like I've been like browsing real estate in the south of France. Uh-huh. Because I feel like that's the level of hit this is going to be. It's so stupid. I'm not big, not chateaus, like two beds in Provence. Okay, how about just apartments? Can we just start with apartments? I'm not buying a house in Cannes. God. Mm. Okay, so um, I'm going to do the opening titles. Okay. Did you watch the episode, just to be clear? Yeah, I did, yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist Watchers, and just like that, The Sex and the City Reheal, with me, Deborah Francis White, and my very special guest, Alex Wise. Episode 8, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. So, Alex Wise. Hi, um, Deb. Just to introduce you to my audience, sure. uh, you are a Broadway star uh, and also uh, an emerging filmmaker. You're currently making uh, a brilliant film. Uh, am I allowed to say the name of it? It's been announced. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah, it was, it was, it was in the trades. Summoning Sylvia, which is, is it okay to say the logline? Yeah, I think so. It was in the, it was in variety. So I think it's all safe. Fine. If it's in if it's in the trades, darling, if, it's yes. fine to talk about. Right. It's now um, public. Go for it. Yeah. My my friend, who's a showrunner, told her little boy because he's sort of like knows because you know his mom talks about it all the time. She was like, "We got a green light," and he said, literally said, "Is it in the trades?" <gasps> like I'll believe it when it's in the trades. Like wow. she was like, "It's not yet." Well, I need to read it. But then when he saw it in Variety, he said, "Is it in the New York Times?" Like he was looking for it's, more. Like, it's never good enough for these kids, you know. They, they just, they always a, want more. He's he's an artist though, isn't he? Because that's exactly yeah. our response to any good news is like, it needs to be better. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, so Summoning Sylvia is a, can you do the log line? Uh, sure. It's a, it's a horror comedy movie and I co-wrote it and co-directed it with Wesley Taylor, who is another mutual friend of ours. And uh, it is about a gay bachelor party that performs a seance in a haunted house and chaos and social messaging ensue. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it I is, describe it. it. Is, uh, what I love about your work, and I very much loved your web series, Indoor Boys, and if people haven't watched it, it is very brilliant. Thank you. Um, I love the way you represent uh, across the board, but especially the way you represent gay men and uh, women over 40. Uh, I've yeah. got to say. You really, really they're, well, you're... first off, they're one and the same to me. Um, <laughs> but of course they're not. Of course they're not. Uh, you know, I, I, I love, well, I'll tell you this, um, something that has always struck me um, is the way I feel that uh, women over 40 are as bright and capable and brilliant as they have ever been. Uh, they are at the peak of their emotional and intellectual lives, and they are discarded often by society. And so in that way, I feel like that's mirroring the queer struggle. And so I really love writing for um those people who are marginalized, whether they are uh, women who are over 40, for instance, or queer people or, um, you know, others as well. But I, I just, I get very excited by uh, 
their stories and and finding the comedy and the heart and the suspense and all of it. So anyway, that's, you know, what I'm doing. Well, I love your work and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited by uh, summoning Sylvia. And I'm very excited on your take on And Just Like That because uh, I think you're the first man we've consulted. You're really? the first, and gay men are represented you know, have been represented over the years uh, on Sex and the City. And it is a show that, frankly, I think some of my gay male friends love more than my female friends. Like, yeah. it's much, it's a much loved show. You were rewatching it in lockdown. Yeah, I, absolutely. I was. Yeah. And, and I think I started rewatching it in lockdown because of you. We, I think like, we, we were the often season, watching series. it together. We kind of uh, synced up a little bit and we were reporting to each other on our Sex and the City whereabouts. I had to stop because. It was the really dark days of lockdown, like when things were getting dark at four o'clock. We really, in in London, we weren't allowed to see anyone. We weren't allowed to go out. It was like one walk a day, but that walk would have been dark and cold. And um, it felt like I would never see the light of day again. And I would late night watch Sex and the City when I would see that you were watching it or Raven Smith was watching it. And uh, I would go on eBay and then like buy some designer handbag that's like a million years old that like a handbag that Carrie Bradshaw herself used in the 90s <laughs> yeah. it's kind of beaten up so you can get it for a really good price on eBay and um I was like earning no money because it was the darkest days of lockdown I had nowhere to carry anything so like what was I buying a handbag for like what I'm going to take something from the kitchen yeah. to the bedroom like what <laughs> you know and I was just like it was making me believe that one day again I would be walking down the street with my you know as Carrie would say with my tote or my cappuccino and like I be like believing in that time again and I was like I bought two handbags and I was like you need to not watch this show again not sure in well I mean especially if the show is going to become a financial burden for you but I think it's very <laughs> important that um that we live our fantasies and I think you getting those handbags was um was in service to that and also I think I've uh, used them a lot since but well the way. good okay they came they in represent handy represent something for me now and I take them out you know good. Uh, also people were selling stuff cheaply as well people were like I got a, they were going through their wardrobes and they were getting rid of stuff because they had time yeah. and they also needed a bit of extra cash. So you could get some great deals in those days, just to be clear. Mm. Well, I mean, I think you you did it well and you did it right. And I was really happy to be watching Sex in the City with you because um, you, in those dark days of lockdown, it gave us that little sense of community. And and, and mm. we could we could all um, love the show together and be horrified by the show together. See which parts have not aged well, and <laughs> and I think it prepped us quite well for um, its new chapter. Yes, indeed, because we were sort of back in the fray, something we hadn't plugged into for a while. Yeah. Uh, what is your history with Sex the City? What age were you when you first started watching it? How did you grow to love it? Let's see. Okay, so I think what the series finale was two thousand five. Is that correct? Something like that, I think. Two thousand and four. Four. Okay, so I was I was in high school at the time. Um, that was toward the end of high school for me, and I remember the first episode I ever watched of the show was the series finale because my mom and my what? and yeah, I know my mom and my older sister were watching it, and I just had never, I had never watched it before, and um, and then oh, once God, I got I to college. That. Yeah. All my friends, all my girlfriends, yeah. uh, my platonic girlfriends, um, they all had the box sets of Sex and the City. And that's when I started really watching it because it was um, it was always on. It was a, a social activity. And, you know, before we had streaming, we would just take out our DVD box sets. I had 30 Rock right. and Six Feet yeah. Under and, you know, the things I loved. And my friends had Sex and the City. So I started watching it then. And in the years since, I think I've watched that whole series through a few times. Do you know what? I just had a look. Yeah. 2003. Oh, God, finale. kill me. Okay, so I was... what that means is that next year, the finale will have aired 20 years ago. Wow. And we look the same. So... Well, There's I that. certainly do. Yeah, me too. Um, okay, so 2003, I was, I guess I was in 10th grade-ish. I think I was around there. Oh, and so you watched, I can't even imagine. So you knew when you when you first saw her bump into Big in the street and drop her condoms on, out of her bag and stuff, you knew she's going to end up with that guy. Oh, like, you mean when I began watching it later? Um, that, yeah. that I, like that I had the context. When you watched episode context. one, you knew. Yeah. 
Yeah, so but there, there was up with there was no suspense as to who she ends up with for me, but that didn't matter because, as we know, with sex and the city, it's really just um about the journey. It's about the moment to moment stuff. And also, I didn't really care so much about Carrie. I loved, I loved Charlotte. I don't know. I loved Charlotte. I loved all oh. the things that she went through, and she was the one I connected to. I felt like you're she, a Charlotte. I know. I know. I don't seem like a Charlotte, but. For some reason, that story, like the stuff with her, especially her infertility, and which I thought um, Kristen Davis handled yeah. so beautifully and honestly, and I think it's still one of the best depictions of that pain that I've seen in a television series. Not that I know firsthand, but it's in my family very much. And, and so um, that's a story that touches me. And so I, I really love that. And I love the way that she had to shake off this notion of um, letting go of the Prince Charming she thought she was supposed to be with so she could make way for oh, my buzz, my freaking buzzer going off. Listen to that. Ruining the podcast. Um, I'm so happy because you're in New York and your buzzer's going off. And yeah. I feel like I'm plugging right into Sex the City. Do you need to get that? No, I'm not getting it. It's probably just like the delivery. It's fine. Um <laughs> If it goes yeah. again, I'll no, no, I'll go into the other room. What I'm if it's your What if it's your Mister Big? I just hope it's my Aiden, really. Um, <laughs> now, what, if you're a Charlotte, you really want it to be your Harry. I know, I know. So, so on that, the story of somebody who has to let go of the Prince Charming of of the thing they thought they were supposed to have, so they could make way for the thing that they're actually meant to have. That's a very poignant story to me because so much of my life has been about. Um, <laughs> the way things have unfolded have been um, totally the opposite of what I expected or planned for. And I've had to make way for the unexpected. Anyway, Charlotte did that so beautifully through the series. And so that's a story that I kept hanging on to. Can I tell you something I found out the other day? Yeah, please. I read an old interview with Kristen Davis and she said, they said, how much do you like Charlotte? And she went, I'm like Carrie. I don't know that I want to get married. This is an old interview, but she was like, I don't know wow. that I want to get married. I've never wanted commitment. And then I was like, oh my God, because SJP got married, you know, relatively young, committed to kids, has been with the same guy the whole time. I was like, oh, you know my revelation? She's Charlotte is a Carrie and Carrie is a Charlotte. a Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? I, that's, um, that's some heavy stuff. That's some like Matrix level um, Sex in the City trivia there. Yeah. It's Inception, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There it is. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about this episode. All right, if we have to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so just to do a quick recap, mm -hmm. I would say what happened this week was Carrie discovers that her younger self has moved in downstairs and what it's like to live above younger her, her in her 30s. Um, noisy. Yes, that's uh, well messy. put. Her younger self. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's what they're doing. She's got curly hair. She keeps coming out in bras, not wearing not wearing any shirt or wearing a crop top. She's so or see-through tops she wears as well. She's so carry. Mm -hmm. And I think there's hidden Easter eggs in there. I always find the hidden Easter eggs in there. So I think I'm gonna reveal some to you or try and get you to guess what I think I've seen. Okay. Um I uh Charlotte's storyline was that she was on her knees in the bathroom about to pleasure her husband when her elder daughter comes in, sees them. It's not clear to me why they've left the bathroom door open when they're children in the house, but they have. Yeah, it seems some interesting an unlikely choices. decision for someone as pretty as Charlotte. But anyway, we've got to suspend our disbelief a bit. It's a TV show. Um, and this leads her on to a discussion with her daughter about sex and them both being, you know, hedging around each other. Miranda's affair with Shay goes on. Shay discovers that... Miranda is not in an open marriage, but is in fact cheating on her partner and says, absolutely, I'm not down for this. And so Miranda says, don't worry, I'm going to change the circumstances very obliquely and then goes off uh, to tell Steve that she wants a divorce. And just like that, I have summed up the episode. So how did you feel, uh, firstly, about uh, this rally that it's an LGBTQ plus rally. How truthful was that to an LGBTQ plus rally that you may have been to in New York? You are our first proper New Yorker. 
we need you to be like a TV anchor, you know, like there you are live in New York with the action. You've probably just seen Carrie walking around a block in her marigold gloves. Yeah. Well, first off, I, I would describe it as an anti-mask rally. That's really what it looked like to me. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a post-mask universe. They've made that clear. Yeah, They've yeah. made it clear that COVID's in the rearview mirror. Ugh, if only. Um, well, I, I don't know. It looked like a lovely, quaint little gay pride parade for some reason. Um, I didn't question the reality of the queer rally. That didn't seem weird to me. Um, I was just focused really on Che um, and how once again we got to see Che do stand up with no jokes. And that's really just where my focus has been. I, it is strange, isn't it? Why yeah, have I, I not got a comic to write? Well, this, also, I don't know. The thing, that actress. the thing that's so strange to me is they have they have writers. I mean, the, the other girls in the episode, they get jokes. They know how to write jokes. They're writers. They're writing for a comedy. It's almost as if they've made a decision to make sure Che has no punchlines when performing. It, it, it's, Do you think it's because dialogue jokes are different from stand-up comedy jokes? There's a, like I know a lot of great sitcom writers, but they couldn't necessarily write stand-up. I don't think you can write stand-up unless you've done stand-up, but I think it's also quite tricky to write stand-up for someone who isn't you. From well, I mean, that's that's a fair point, but I just wish there was some effort put in. I do hear you. I really, I really hope they take that feedback on because I don't think we're the only people who've said it. I think no, this is you know well tread like territory. I'm, no, no, I'm not saying that. It's more like um, I feel like Twitter is also sending that message to the writers, and I really do hope they hear it so that if we get a season two, they get a comic to work with. What What's their name? Uh, their name is Sada Ramirez. They Sada Ramirez. Yeah, they were on um, uh, Grey's Anatomy. Also, they were. Um, a Broadway star and have one of oh. the most spectacular singing voices. They won a Tony Award for really? Spam a lot. Isn't that isn't that a little Wow. I don't know. You you should I mean listeners, you should you should do some YouTube searching of Sada Ramirez uh singing because you know, Che Diaz is a is a challenging character, I think, for many of us, but Sada Ramirez is a truly talented individual who uh, has just one of the most wildly powerful, beautiful singing voices, and is a great, great actor. So I mean no disrespect to Sara. I, I I wish them well. Yeah, I feel I feel like I need to look at their other stuff. Um, because they're clearly a great performer, but it's just it's it's, it's yeah, it's kind of bumpy. It's tough. It's real tough. How did you feel about the scene where Miranda sneaks off and then Che comes after her and says what are you doing? Why are you sneaking off? And she says, I, my son, I didn't want my son to see me here. He doesn't know about me or you. And they were very surprised by that. Well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one thing is they strangely didn't address why Miranda's son was at this rally, or if that is a plot point worth noting. He was one of the allies. Shay pointed and said, and to our LGBTQ allies. Yeah, but like allies of, were all, of standing all in their own people, pen. of all people in New York, there were does... there were fifty people at that rally. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it wasn't huge. It wasn't like all the young people are going, and it's like, yeah, it's true. Like nothing about self serving, sex obsessed Brady, who is still at school and like doing maths tutoring and just shagging his girlfriend morning, noon, and night. Says, oh. Do you know the big thing about me that no one knows is I'm an LGBTQ plus <laughs> ally. Right. So dedicated that I will go to a rally. A rally spare time. of 50 people and see this jokeless comic. Um. <laughs> it does seem extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I thought it would be a cooler thing if he hadn't been in the allies, but also allies don't stand in their own section, just to be clear. But um, <laughs> it's like our allies and over here. And it's like, so that had to be clear that he wasn't. I think it'd be more interesting if he and his girlfriend both identified as bi or pan because they're very young people and, you know, they're right? cool. And then that would be great. Yeah, I think and that would be more if she saw him there in a rainbow colors and his girlfriend and thought, are they queer? Like, are they identifying as queer? Because the whole thing is about fluidity and non-binary and like, and and therefore maybe pansexuality might play into that in another intersection. I think it um, would be overwhelming for the older viewers if every child, though, was queer. <laughs> every child on the show. It's true. We have to it's have a true. limit. There can't be too many in a room, you know? 
It's true. This is playing to a very Gen X audience. Yeah, it really is. And some of the Gen Xers might be maxed out. Not me. I'm Gen X and I'm not maxed out no. on uh, on this content. But I see what you're saying. There's a bunch of Charlottes, Gen X Charlottes watching. Yeah. Not, to, not to cast dispersions on your people there, Alex, because I know you're a Charlotte. But Yes, yes. So, I mean, know. I'm a millennial Charlotte, I think. You're a yeah. You're with a like cool a, gay millennial Charlotte. Yeah, with like think... with like a Miranda rising or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Oh God, um, I think I was a Carrie. I hope I was never as narcissistic and self obsessed, but I think I was a Carrie. But I've caught late onset Samantha. Like I've sort of <laughs> developed. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, I, there's a cream for that. I, Kim Cattrall should be advertising it because, <laughs> really? you know. Um, what I find very difficult about this whole cheating storyline is Chase looking at her in, with some sort of disdain going, what are you doing? You didn't tell me that you cheated on your partner and now I'm complicit in this. I'm not this person. I don't cheat. I don't lie. I assumed you were in an open marriage because otherwise why would you be doing this? And I have the same question for Miranda because she's the kind of person who got very upset when her husband cheated on her, even though they hadn't, in the movie, they hadn't had sex in a year or something in that scenario. They were much younger. He came to her straight away devastated. I slipped up. It was only once. I hadn't had sex in so long. And she punished him for so long. And neither she nor her friends have said, why haven't a friend said, but when Steve cheated on you, you were devastated. I don't, I don't angry. know. They did an entire movie about it. An entire movie about how terrible Steve was for immediately owning up to what he did. And now, I, I mean, what, so I have a couple of thoughts here. One of them is that I don't understand Che's sudden puritanical judgment because Che seems like they have no rules. And uh, it's a little hard for me to... That, that feels a little out of character to me, I, I think, that suddenly they're on a moral high ground. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong there. I know what you mean, but they're all about that sort of new open, like they're polyamorous, which is uh-huh. clearly going to come back to bite Miranda in the ass. Um, oh, absolutely. They're absolutely. They're setting that up. Especially with Che at the end saying, I can't give you traditional, and Miranda not understanding that. Yeah. But I don't know why they were speaking so obliquely. We'll get to that. I do know why, because TV writers were writing it and they didn't want to. Yeah, that's real. You know, but it it was very, it was, it was one of those TV oblique misunderstandings <laughs> that was going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I do understand the polyamorous person who goes, the point of polyamory, the point of open relationships is no one has to lie and cheat around and run around. I've done that. I've been that person. I don't want to be that person. So now I'm in a world where I don't do that. I'm very honest. I'm very open with all my partners and you've drawn me into that world. And mm-hmm. I, so I do understand that because I think there's a difference between being fluid and open and untraditional and somebody who wants to hurt, you know, the whole point of all that is you don't hurt anybody, right? you know, with openness. Um, I get that, but I don't get Miranda having absolutely no conscience at all about this. It's so when she ridiculous. Reacted, or why aren't her friends saying to her, you got so angry with Steve. You didn't forgive I don't him know. for so long. I mean, I think, I think one of the big problems of this show is what they've done to Steve Brady who was yeah. just one of the loveliest characters and says at, at the end of the episode, I was always there for you. I feel like this is the first time that we've seen Steve <laughs> also in that scene that he has at the end. When Miranda finally tells Steve the truth, uh, that's the first time Steve has had a scene with dignity in it. Because, yes, I yeah, agree. I'm actually very bothered um, by the writers just um, totally erasing everything that Steve was through the first series. And also I'm really bothered by the fact that uh, they use Steve being hard of hearing as like a mark against him. They're, they're, yeah, I think it's really shitty. And they're, they're, you know, Miranda's always so impatient. Like if, if he can't hear you, you know, if he can't hear you on the phone, Miranda in the market, then send him a freaking text. But instead she's like so impatient. And, and I feel like, uh, it's very unfair, not only to deaf people, but to, to the character of Steve and, uh, you know, being deaf is, uh, not, um, a mark against one's sexual viability. And mm. I feel like the show is uh, kind of saying that. That's that's what I've picked up on at least. Well, I heard on the Writers' Room podcast, Michael Patrick King said when he first called 
David Eigenberg mm-hmm. to play Steve Brady to say, hey, would you like to reprise this role? He, the first thing he said is, you know, I have hearing aids now. And Michael Patrick King said, don't worry, we'll write that into the show. Which had they written it into the show in a way that was as inclusive of disability as they are really reaching to be in areas of race and gender and exactly. gender queerness and queerness. Exactly. Such a blind spot with disability and it really bothers me. And I'm like, why? But I don't see Miranda as someone. Yeah, she is short-tempered and one gets short-tempered with one's partner and they've always had a quite bickery relationship. Right. But I don't see Miranda as an unkind, insensitive person. And when she's going so far out of her way to become a human rights lawyer and, you know, insert herself into a more humanitarian role mm-hmm. to not be kind or or just not even kind, just like decent to your partner. If she'd lost her hearing and Steve was going, I don't want to shout, put your hearing aid in. I don't want to shout. I think she would be very hurt and she would be being made to feel. We would see that as very, we would see that as Steve, what are you doing? You know, nice. Miranda can't hear very well. And don't make her feel bad about that and just be decent about that and go, oh, any chance you're hearing it? Because I really need to have a good chat with you and I want to make sure you get everything I say. Don't go, I don't want to shout. Like, it's such a strange thing to do and it doesn't fit with her current value set or the decency we have seen her had before. Like, things like making her husband of many years who has been faithful to her apart from one slip up, which he was really punished for, kind to her for many years, making him reenact a sex scene you've had with your lover that he doesn't know about so you can get off. I'm like, don't, that's not, that's like someone without a conscience. Like that's really kind of sociopathic to do that. Yeah, that was rough. I don't know. I just, I miss Steve. I love Steve. And uh, Steve was my boy. And I do a really good Steve impression. And I just feel like. Yes. You can, when I've got the, some of the dialogue written down. So when we get to that, I'm going to ask you to do it. Yeah. Just text it to me and and I will do a full um, reading and it will be beautiful. And I will bring your listeners to tears. Um, I really am excited about it. Yeah, of course. you do it and I know how convinced it is. (laughs) One of the reasons I think disabled people are not represented properly on television, they don't have very powerful lobbies or like it's not, they're not very visible in the wider society. So it's not like people are getting hurt by it. It's just that they can't get their message through as easily. And do you remember what Seema says when Carrie, ironically in a meta way, I think says is how does she afford that apartment when she's that age? i.e. I had this apartment when I was her age and people were asking, watching the TV show, asking that question. I think that was a kind of joke about how do people have these apartments on TV. Do you remember what Seema says? That the young woman downstairs is probably... A Russian hooker? Yes. Sex workers. They are always the butt of jokes on television. It's like, ah, they don't count. And it's like, and that wasn't a particularly mean thing to say. It was just a way of saying it that was like, you know, like... If she'd said, honestly, I sell a lot of property to sex workers who, you know, make a lot of money and yada, yada, there was no respect in it. It was like, ah, she's probably a Russian hooker. And there's other jokes in it that have been like, I'm not a hooker type thing. Um, you made me feel like a hooker, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the other thing is they still have a blind spot towards uh, weight because last week Seema's uh, – parents said what's wrong with this guy we haven't met to Carrie is he ugly is he fat and Carrie said no he's fine uh yeah that's... and I feel like Carrie now would say because she's in she does this really contemporary intersectional feminist podcast like you know I don't know if it's feminist but you know like this really contemporary intersectional podcast wouldn't she say that wouldn't be a reason to not introduce you. You know, like, wouldn't she like make a, I'd make a little remark. If somebody said that to me, I'd be like, well, I don't really know what you mean by ugly, but you know, like I know many attractive, wonderful fat men who would be great partners. Like I would, I would make a little quip back. I would say something. Cause I would like, I don't, I'm not going to go. No, he's fine. So I think that for all the attention to progressive values that sometimes they're doing in, in what has been a very heavy-handed way and has been widely criticized for that there are blind spots yeah yeah and uh i just miss steve i love steve i mean we're getting to the impersonation (laughs) um 
<laughs> it's all, it's the only it. reason I agreed to do this. I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, thank you for seeing me as I am. Okay, continue. I, <laughs> um, uh, so then we have Carrie's neighbor downstairs, who is mm-hmm. the replica of Carrie at 35. This neighbor downstairs is making too much noise on the stoop with her friends. And she rings the young guy she does the podcast with and there's lots of signals all the time that she's old. Like all the time they're signaling it. I'm like, she's only 55. I don't think people in their 50s go around talking about how old they are. But she phones this guy to go, what's the cool way of asking people to be quiet? And I'm like, is that something? Would you, if you needed to ask a teenager to be quiet, I, I don't think that might be similar. Yeah, yeah. I don't think um, I'd need to phone a friend in order to figure it out. I thought that was a strange scene. Um a strange leap of logic, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I, I got to say too, the first thing I thought of when that storyline started to unfold is I was getting um, Samantha flashbacks when she had the new downstairs neighbors who were the trans, oh. uh, the trans women. Transgender who, women, yeah. Yeah, who were, who were um, making noise on her stoop, on her street. And then she ended up befriending them. I kind of thought, wait a second, haven't we done this before? But it was nice mm-hmm. to see that the storyline went in a slightly different direction. It became more a mirror of Carrie's youth, you know? Yes. Um, but there was another Samantha reference, another Samantha Easter egg, I think. Oh, there was? I missed it. Yeah, for the same storyline. So I do think they're evoking Samantha here. When Carrie goes to give the blondies to her neighbor... Oh. To say sorry, the man comes to the door and drops his towel. Oh, right. Just like uh, the new meatpacking district neighbor, right? Exactly. Yeah. The stockbroker. And yes. she is also bringing baked goods. Do you remember she's bringing a basket, like a welcome wagon basket, like of brownies or something? And he says, if I take that basket, I'm going to drop my towel. And she says, I know. And so the towel is dropped deliberately. So I think they are like playing with Samantha. Do you think, I keep thinking they're trying to lure Kim Cattrall back for season two. Yeah, I definitely think they are. And I think it's a losing game, um, but it's, it's very sweet to see them try. And I miss Samantha too. I really miss her too, but I just think there's, there's no way that, um, you know, based on everything I've seen that Kim Cattrall has said, she just has no interest, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the offer will go so high and uh, it'll be, so, I, I think the most we're ever going to get is a Zoom call. I think we might get a FaceTime from Samantha. Maybe. We can we can just like do a deep fake of Samantha at this she point. She could record her side of it without anyone else being there. She might do that for a million trillion pounds. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Oh, can we also, since we're talking about dropping towels, can we talk about how yeah. there were two penises in this week's episode? Yes. Not one. But two. But two. Did we see Harry's though? We saw the downstairs name. Oh, we saw it. It was quite a prop, I imagine. Oh, I did not see that. You, I did. I. You and must I have saw, and I watched. I was watching a couple of times because I know I'm going to miss things the first time around, and I missed his penis twice. Wow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maybe they cut it out for the version I saw. Because oh, I, but I saw the other one. I saw the other one quite clearly. Um, I, it was definitely in the one I just watched on. HBO Max and uh, I'm gonna need to watch it again. Yeah, I mean, it was like may- maybe they, it, perhaps if they, I mean, how how do they air it in in the UK? Is it on HBO or is it? Uh it's on Sky and Now TV. Okay, so um, I mean, that was like a a. I'm sorry if this is too blue, but that was a half erect penis. And was it? It, it was. It was present. Uh, that's why they cut it out. Okay. Because I don't think you can have an erect penis on TV here. Yeah. Okay. Then they cut the shot. Okay. Because that was, that, that penis, it was yelling at me, that penis. It was. It was hard. It was standing up. It was, it was standing more outward. It was a semi. Yeah. It was like a semi. Yeah. Wow. I think that's why I think it's illegal to have an erect penis on a British television set. It's just illegal to have an erect penis. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah, in Britain, there are, it is illegal to have an erect penis, but it's very hard to police. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, let's talk about this Charlotte storyline. Sure. Um, Charlotte is trying to make Harry use a kind of Fitbit ring type thing. He makes her jokingly kneel down and then says, while you're down there. And she's like, sure, honey. 
I kind of like that Charlotte's changed so much. Yeah. But do you remember an episode where Charlotte broke up with a guy because she didn't give blowjobs at all? Um, back in the old timey days. Mm. Oh, back. Oh, very much back in the old timey days. I think it was like season one or two. I Charlotte. He keeps pushing her head down. Yeah. She's like, I don't do that. Yeah, and I remember. Goes, I remember him pushing no. the head down, and yes, and her He's resisting. He's perfect in every way, but he he likes blowjobs, and she just like she's saying, I just don't. I don't want to give them. And she tells the girls at brunch, I'm just sorry, I just don't do that. And I love, I do love that she's changed because you meet the right person and then you find that that kind of thing can be exciting and sexy and, you know, yeah. all of that. I People do change. I mean, that was a long time ago. What did you think of her friends being so shocked that she still, as they put it, blows Harry? I, I mean, listen, I'm a gay man. So I was just like, wh- why is this shocking with her? sole sex partner her her only sex partner i i mean of course they do different things is it really a rule that women when they're in a long relationship no longer blow their husbands and that that's it seems like that's what carrie and um miranda were insinuating now i know miranda's in a sexless marriage but but i don't know it felt very odd to me what did you think i found it odd i f- i i wished Anthony had been the four at the table. They keep auditioning that fourth seat. Yeah. And then they just decided today, ah, oh, we just won't have anyone in the fourth seat. But I think Anthony should have been there representing and going, you know, of course she does. You know, like somebody needed to represent the other side of that. And I feel like I, I'm surprised that Carrie was, that Carrie clearly then had stopped giving blowjobs to Big. That was clearly the message for me. Yeah. I, I who was it? Um, a great writer was it Emily Nussbaum, perhaps? Sorry, Maybe. if I'm, who wrote a piece about Sex in the City, and she talks about how Carrie's evolution is from being more um, sex positive to being much more prudish by the end of the series. Mm. I thought that was an interesting. Yeah, I believe it's Emily she became Nussbaum. Became more of a Charlotte. And yeah, Charlotte became more of a Carrie. That's oh yeah. My gosh, it's just a big switcheroo. But it was very strange to me that everybody was so shocked that she blew her husband. And also that that took precedence over the fact that Miranda is getting a divorce. Yes. They tabled that for a convo about a blowjob. Shouldn't those have been switched? It does seem strange to me that, because I can imagine absolutely Charlotte blurting that out. And and then after a while, Miranda going, okay, I've got a big heavy subject and I'm so sorry to interrupt this blowjob chat for it, but I have to. But it was the other way around. Everyone was just like, I guess you're getting a divorce then. That's fine. And we're not like, how's he going to take it? We're there for him too. Like there was no, it was just like, I guess he's just going to have to get over it. And I was like, do men not have feelings? This is really (laughs) not okay. It's Um, so odd to me. So odd. And then, and then, and then the big conversation of the table was a blowjob job not the fact that but Miranda kept saying it. I understand him saying it the first time because Charlotte was pretty sure Charlotte didn't like giving blowjobs so I think yeah. it's fine to tease Charlotte like wow you're down on your knees when your kid's in the house like you know that's a it's not how we see you Charlotte it's not how you advertise yourself like I get that they, of course they're going to tease her about it but they kept doing it and I was like wow they really did think that it sounds like if you're in a long-term relationship that is just off the table and I uh-huh. was like I'm happy Harry and Charlotte have a good sex life. That made me feel Yeah, happy. somebody's got to have a good sex life on the show. My goodness. So I'm glad that it's Charlotte because she's been through so much. And it's a nice twist that it's Charlotte. Yeah. That Charlotte is now the sex positive one. I think that's nice that she's got there. She's evolved to that place. Yeah, I like that too. Um, while we're on Charlotte, how did you find her uh, scene with Lily and the phone? Like, oh, Lily's posing in a provocative way in workout clothes on the phone. Um, I was sort of, I, I was not offended by that storyline. It seems like a very realistic storyline and something that kids actually do today. And, um, and yeah, it's a conversation friends of mine have had with teenage kids yeah. and like being shocked and then, and being shown their, uh, shock and disapproval and then felt bad and being like, why do they have to feel bad about liking their body? And like, you know, and have but having to have the talk, um, what did you think about the the ending of that line when she says, you know what daddy and I were doing 
in the bathroom and she was like, yes, did you find any cancer? I thought that um, was a great, I thought that was a great moment. And I was really relieved that Charlotte didn't say, no, honey, I was blowing your father because I was <laughs> really expecting it to go there. And I was very relieved that we didn't have to do that. I thought that was an adorable twist. And it yeah. sort of said that, look, a lot of 15 year olds might be posing on Instagram and they might actually be incredibly innocent in other ways. I suspect in real life, Lily would have had a, more of a clue, but I liked I liked the innocence and I didn't find it implausible. Yeah, me neither. It um, was it was a nice moment and it was a nice moment between mother and daughter, I thought, and and I uh I was I was not offended by that part of the episode. <laughs> no, I thought it was cute. It was yeah. a cute little storyline and, and quite in keeping with the Sex of the City B and C plots of old. Yeah. Let's get to the big old Steve conversation now. <sighs> um I'm glad Steve got to say. I've always fought for us and I'm, you know, in fact, I'm going to give you the dialogue of what he said so that you can do it for us. All right. So you want to, yeah. Um, okay. Sure. Sure. So this is a little bit of the latest episode as recreated with the incredible comic mimicry stylings of Alex Wise. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Miranda, you're always like this. You don't think I'm enough, <laughs> kind of not enough. I'm always there. Hanging in there for us. I'm, I'm too old to rally for us again. I, I don't want to. I want you to be happy. I don't know what else you think is out there. All right, there you go. Yeah! There's my Steve. How was that? Was that okay? That was actually incredible. And I was trying <laughs> not to laugh too audibly. Because it was... Um, you know, Brilliant. listen, we all have a talent and I only have one. And it's um, apparently doing Steve from Sex in the City. I am sure you have many more talents, but I, I hope they're not going to write him out because, you know, your work's going to dry up. Yeah, um, I know. This is really, that was really my gateway. That's the only reason I'm upset they're doing Steve Dirty in this, in this uh, show is yeah, because I just want to, like, yeah, because I want to do my drag performance as Steve Brady. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that was incredible. And it really took me back to this poignant moment. And I felt for Steve, I was like, yeah, you tell her, you have pushed for this again and again and again. What I felt robbed of yeah. is that she says, I've met someone else, and then we don't really get to see his reaction. We can't. And I'm like, I think Steve needs his own back here. He needs to go, what do you mean? Because he did it one time and immediately Ashen Faced came and told her, like, I slipped. That's and I right. have to tell you. What Shay said is we've been doing it full time like rabbits for three weeks. Yeah, and, and you know what? In fact, even longer than three weeks, if you're if you're thinking about, because uh, there was the three month break between the texting, and so this has been going on for a long time. Miranda's been harboring these feelings, and it's just crazy. It's crazy. Why didn't we get to see Steve look her in the eye and go, "You judged me so hot, and now you're going to go off and, you know, yeah, do the, the not have the respect to tell me." To me, that's the story. Like that's the that's the big story to me. That's the headline is the fact that they have all this history where this something similar has happened and it's being totally swept under the rug. And no one has mentioned it once. So and odd. Then when she rings Carrie, she goes, Carrie, I've done it. I've done it. I feel so free. I told him all my emotions. And she says, I said it all. I didn't blame him. Why is he to blame? And I didn't make him feel bad. And I'm like, are you insane? You definitely made him feel bad. Are you? Did you see his little face? I think Miranda must be a bad. sociopath. There's no other explanation. It's so strange to me because it's just not what we know of Serena. Then she's in a cab on the way to the airport because she's going to surprise Shay at their comedy show. Now that's going like, to go terribly, obviously. So well, of course. Because right. people love to be surprised in their workplace <laughs> when they... When I have just told you, I can't give you anything traditional. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we can we can already see what's coming is that Miranda's going to show up and Che is going to be there with um, another woman, perhaps or or something. And uh, you know, I, oh. I I'm sure there's no I, I don't know I don't know I don't know poor I Steve. Shay, we're not going to see a polyamorous storyline where Shay is going to explain I am in love with you and I'm also in love with Dora and Mabel. I don't know why these people have the names of yeah, yeah. old women. This show just went right back to the 20s. Um, exactly. But I'm here for it. Um, and that's how polyamory works. And mm -hmm. Miranda's going to be like, so I could have stayed in my domestic nest, having my dessert, co-parenting my child, and also had this wonderful thing because I could have said to Steve, 
I need to open the marriage. You know, we don't really have a sex life. And is it okay if I go and explore this pansexual side and this is something I need to do? Of course, Steve would have said, I want to, I want you to be happy, Miranda. But he would have said it like this. I want you to be happy, Miranda. Miranda, it's I'm, me. It's me, Steve. We have a son. Brady, a son. I want you to be happy. Okay, there you go. So then if Miranda said to Steve, maybe just workshop this a little. Yeah. Um, but Steve, are you okay with me being with a non-binary person, maybe going out and having affairs with women when I'm 70, 70? Are you going to still be here? Do you, are you going to want that? What if you come home and find us together in the kitchen? Yeah, it's okay, Miranda. I just want you to be happy. And that's Steve Brady. <laughs> What if there's just like four naked breasts in your kitchen with 75? How are you going to feel about that? What if you come home and I'm with four people with breasts? How are you going to feel, Steve? I guess we're going to need a lot of ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. God, this is... This is the scene that should have been written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Wasn't it so emotionally affecting too? Um, <laughs> I... I am crying now yeah, more I see, than I yeah. did when I saw Steve on the screen. Yeah, so I'm no, just it's, saying. it's understandable. If anybody's listening who's casting David Eigenberg, you know, Alex has to be his son or his nephew or little brother or something. Or his twin lover. <laughs> I don't know. I just wanted to throw in another option. That's that's something for the big Steve fans, uh, <laughs> the fan fiction, Steve and his twin, his younger twin lover. Yeah, there are some, um, there are some websites I can direct you to. So the Brady Bunch is breaking up, basically, in yeah. this story. Uh, again, Miranda is throwing a little hand grenade into the family, but my prediction is she's going to come back to Steve and go, could we put this back together and call this an open relationship? Because I don't like being alone at night and having ice cream on my own while Shay is off, you know, with lovers I don't know and I don't know if I can handle it and yada, 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 and so on and so forth. What is your prediction? Um, I don't know. I mean, okay, so the more dramatic choice is that Steve would say, no, thank you. You broke up with me, Miranda. However, I, I also, we've been conditioned during this new run of the show to see that Steve has no opinions, is a total pushover. And so it would be, it would actually be in character now for this new Steve to just go, okay, you know, and not have any backbone about it. But I think Steve really deserves um, a woman who's going to love him. You know, something I'm confused about with the Steve storyline, speaking of that, is I don't believe that Steve was really happy when he said, I'm happy. This is marriage. This is, this is enough for me. Really? They haven't had sex in, what, years? And apparently he's forgotten. He doesn't even know how to finger his wife, which is crazy. Um, like, I'm gay, and I, I think I could at least get in the ballpark. And <laughs> and, and I just, um, I, I was, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't recover from that. Um, <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, 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 great, Ladies, great, great. if you're listening. <laughs> if you're uh, listening. Alex is gay, but he may be able to get into your ballpark. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, this is going off the rails. Um, yeah. But the point is, do you really believe that Steve was happy with this marriage, the sexless marriage? It's hard for me to believe that he really would have been. People sometimes, if they really love each other and there's a joy in the domesticity and the co-parenting and those kinds of things, I do, yeah, I think that's absolutely. But at what point did you see... Miranda being kind to Steve and giving him moments of co-parenting or moments Fun, of yeah. of nesting or like I feel like that didn't exist. She was Yeah, you're right. They weren't having enough fun and being kind enough to each other and joyful enough with each other and having she wasn't taking enough joy in the TV watching. Uh right. and the ice cream and they weren't teasing each other and I felt like that again was about uh they tried to pin that on Steve's in a way, I don't know, maybe they didn't, but I just saw this. But it felt to me like it was sort of like, well, he can't really hear me anymore, so he can't banter. Yeah, and that I really is so do think, screwed up. I feel like that's just so not true because couples have shorthands. Couples have ways. Couples have – people don't lose – you know, he hasn't – the story is not he's lost his hearing overnight. The story is he's gradually lost his hearing. And you you find your ways and you you have your ways to banter with your partner. 
I don't believe that. I don't believe it. So I, I don't yeah. either. I mean, and I hope that Steve does find happiness and they show us that, however it goes. I hope I so. Really I, hope. I hope so because I think that his character really deserves more than what he's been given. I hope Brady stays with Steve as well. I hope Brady's like, Mom, this is not cool. Yeah, I hope so. As much as a, of an ally as I am, and I really am an ally to your people. Such an ally, he stands in his own section at rallies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as a, I, as a teenager, am going to rallies that are very poorly attended. Yeah. I would um, like to say, too, just a little, little um, side note, the boy who plays Brady, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name right now. Neil. Oh, it's Neil. He and I used to be with the same manager, and he's absolutely lovely. And that's oh, my story. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I used to hang out with him at my manager's office years ago oh in God. Los Angeles. Wow. Sweet, nice boy. Uh, how did we feel about Carrie this week? She, We saw her walking around the block in marigolds and scarves in her hair, so the smoke didn't get on her, so she didn't want another cigarette. <laughs> how plausible is that from the Carrie Bradshaw we know who doesn't leave the house without looking like a million dollars? It's crazy. She looks like a bag lady suddenly. And I don't, uh, I don't believe this. It, it was another um, moment of her being old and out of touch. And I feel like that's the story they were telling this week that she's, she's now the elderly Carrie, which I, I don't know. I don't buy it. No, she's 55 and she looks 42. Like what, why, I know. why? Why? I don't know. It seems so strange to me. She's a she's a vain person. Right. And now she's and like leaving the house with curlers in her hair and like, <laughs> you know, slippers. Like that's what it felt like. It's just not plausible. And she's like, they had this whole witch theme, which is kind of fun, you know, going to the door with a face pack on, which again, I don't believe Carrie would forget that she no. had green stuff on her face. She's, no. so, she's a put together cosmetic. Her whole thing is fashion and looks, really. I was watching the old series and she really is not a cultured person. Like she doesn't like jazz. She doesn't like whatever a man suggested. I don't do hiking. I don't, she, the oh, Russian yeah. was too romantic for her. I don't, poetry, it's like weird and highbrow or, um, you know, classical opera. Oh, it's all too much for me. Like the only thing she really likes is fashion. And so for me, that seems like such a departure. If she's going to have a cigarette a day, you go out and you stoop, you have the cigarette. Obviously, you don't do it in the house in front of all these beautiful clothes. But it's a fun comedy. I see where they're going. They're trying to do a fun comedy moment. Finally, I want to do just a little bit about, I feel like we've really gotten deep into the issues here. We've had some of our Easter eggs. There was one Easter egg that I saw that I loved and I thought was brilliant. And even as I say it, I am aware I might have lost it a little bit. Okay. In as much as I see Sex the City references everywhere now. Because I'm always looking in just and just like that for evocations of the original series, I cannot watch anything without going, that's like that moment. I went to the ballet the other night. Yeah. And someone came out in a tutu and I was like, I know what that's from. You have new titles. <laughs> if that's what happened in my head. And I was like, Deborah, they are not evoking Sex the City. You have you have lost you you've gone too far. You have to pull back. But the <laughs> the problem was the dancers behind the prima ballerina were dressed like candy stripers. I'm not making this up, in pink and white, like when Carrie looked after Big after he'd had his heart bypass. Right. And I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing it everywhere. I, I have an actual problem. Um, but I really do think this is an Easter egg. And I think it, even though I saw an Instagram live with the costume people, the wardrobe people who said, we don't have time for costume Easter eggs. I still believe this was one. Do you remember what Lily was wearing when she was helping Carrie with her clothes? Did you see? She was wearing a poncho. Oh gosh, no, I didn't pick up on this. Okay, right. Okay. She's wearing a poncho and it's exactly the same poncho that Carrie wore in the episode called They Shoot Single People, Don't They? When she turns up to the magazine shoot unprepared, she's not got any makeup on, and they take her picture. Oh, the one that's on the test picture. The cover when she's smoking and looks, yeah. Exactly. And the headline is Single and Fabulous Question, question mark. Question mark, yeah. She says, I never agreed to that. I agreed to Single and Fabulous, exclamation point. Mm. Now, this is why it is an Easter egg, and I know that it is. Okay. Why does she turn up to the photo shoot late? She went out dancing with her friends the night before. She stayed out all night. And then she comes home and thinks, I'll just stay up all morning. I better not go to sleep. And then she falls asleep on her newspaper and oversleeps. What does she then see <laughs> the downstairs neighbor do? 
the downstairs neighbor who is the old her, is the future, is who is the current 35 year old Carrie Bradshaw, is oh. staying up all night. She sees her falling asleep in her clothes on the sofa. Uh huh. This downstairs neighbor, the jewelry designer, is Carrie Bradshaw, and we know it because the single and fabulous question mark poncho, only worn because she stayed up all night, makes an appearance in the show. Have I lost it, or is that definitely a secret message? Um, you know, I, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Miranda, I think it's, I think, I think, I think you have something here. I think you have something here. <laughs> you do not. You think I've lost it. I, I don't know. See. It was, know it was just too well, many Alex. turns. It was just too many turns. I, could, I couldn't follow all the turns. Okay. They sh- the poncho appears and then the downstairs <laughs> neighbor behaves it again. exactly the same way <laughs> that she again? does in the poncho episode. Come okay. on. Okay. 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 But I don't, I don't think we need. Okay. So say that's. Say for, okay, as a thought experiment, say that that is not true. Now, I want you to know that it is true and you totally have something here and it is an Easter egg. But say it's not true. I think we already know that that younger woman is supposed to be a former, or is supposed to be Carrie's past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I think, I think, uh, but that's a lovely detail from a brilliant wardrobe department. Mm Mm-hmm who claim they don't have time to do those things. They say there is no... I asked them directly on an Instagram Live, are there hidden messages in the clothes when they come from the older shows? And they said, no, we have no time for that. Uh, I don't believe them. Yeah, I, I don't I know. Don't, I don't believe them. I'm like, that one, I, I believe them normally. I don't believe them with that one. I feel like it's a very clear signal. I believe these things. I see them and I believe them. And I really do realize I've probably missed the turn off. Nah. It's too late. It's too late. Anything else that you saw in this episode that you wanted to say? I wanted to talk about how um, it's insane that they won't write any jokes for Che Diaz. And it's insane what they've done to Steve's character. Those are the um, things I feel most passionately about. Okay. I I hear you. Um, and uh, I, I feel you on those things. Are you hoping for a season two or are you thinking they should leave it now? I think... Uh, I think we need a season two. I mean, listen, this show has a lot of things they need to work out, I think. But um, I would like to see them try to work them out because I still enjoy watching it. I mean, it's it's so chaotic, this show, but it's um, definitely enjoyable. And I still love spending time with these characters, even if they are infuriating to me right now. If suddenly Michael Patrick King said, I don't want to do this anymore, Alex, you're the new showrunner. Oh. What would you, what would we see from this show in season two? First off, Che Diaz got to have jokes. Um, <laughs> I start okay, so there. That's, that's number one in the first Monday morning in yeah. the writers' room. <laughs> Monday morning, hire me a stand-up comic. Yeah, get, let's get working. Yeah, I'd yeah. be like, I'd be like, all right, everybody, you ever have airplane food? Fill in the rest. Um, and <laughs> just something, <laughs> just give us something. Just start there at least. Um, and uh, what would I do? I don't know. I I think I would. Yeah, I mean, something that bothers me is that uh, that we have three um, friends for each of these characters, three women of color, and all of them seem a little thinly drawn. I would bring one of them to the forefront, make them a three dimensional character, and seat them with the girls at the table. Yeah, I feel that too. I feel like one week in three, we hear about nice fertility problems. Um, then we sort of see Ma doesn't really have, you know, we've just seen her family and, you know, we know that she's single, but we don't really get to see her pursue that, you know, like go on a double date with Carrie or like, there's no purchase really on her yet. I really would have preferred to have populated the world, but then had one key character. I agree. I I thought that was going to be Sada Ramirez when they announced them for the cast. I thought that's what they were doing. Um, yeah, but I, but no. you know, I don't know. I just think that table needs a fourth. Anthony, how do you feel about Anthony sitting in that seat? Well, I really like Anthony. Anthony is funny to me, but Anthony is um, a little, uh, a little one dimensional. Um, how do you feel in general at the the representation of Stanford and Anthony's been in this? this uh, I mean, not it's not great. I also don't think they really did right by Willie Garson by just saying, oh, uh, Stanford left me for some TikTok person or whatever it was, I forget. I feel like he should have had a much 
more dignified. In, I know they tried to shoot a scene with him and he wasn't well enough. Yeah. So that wasn't their intention. But I feel like just the character should have had, he should have been going to do something really wonderful. Like, not like, I don't know if he thinks the TikTok star's famous, like I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I feel like he should have been going to a better place, you know? Like, and it felt like he was like doing something that they sort of slightly diminished. Yeah. And I just, yeah. That's a that's a good idea, yeah. I, I will say though, I don't feel shortchanged about the queer representation in Sex in the City because that's not why I watch the show. Right. And I'm just not I don't need Anthony to be more fleshed out. I want him to be funny and say his one-liners, and I'm f- I'm totally fine with that. He's I, been the funniest person in the show, actually. Absolutely, but that's Mario Cantone. He's just gonna be funny. That guy is so whip smart and funny and and sardonic. I I I love him. But I think that um much like the Golden Girls, um, Sex in the City does this too. They they put the lines that gay men would want to say into the mouths of these women. So I feel right. like that's that's the gay representation is whatever <laughs> whatever Charlotte's going through this week, whatever Carrie's going through this week. Those are essentially, for my money, those are the gay characters on Sex and the City, really. That's interesting. Yeah, that I see. That. I absolutely see that. I do yeah. love Anthony, though, and I do miss Stanford. I miss. Can Stanford I just too. finally ask you: Have you been to the Fat Witch Bakery in Chelsea Market? Yeah, absolutely. I've had many Fat Witch brownies. Those are pretty popular. We were in Chelsea together. Not long ago, yeah, we you were. Not we were. Take me to the Fat Witch Bakery. I know, I look and back it's now on that with some resentment, <laughs> as you should. I meant that as a slight against you. Um, <laughs> it's funny and though. Literally, as- we were walking around Chelsea, and I was looking for good places to buy things to put in Christmas stockings. Right, there was this whole market that never came up. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't go to Chelsea too much, but I am proud of myself. As soon as that came on the screen, I said, "That's Chelsea Market," and I felt excited. I felt like I was. Back in uh, the old Sex in the City, when we would see landmarks and be like, "I know that place, I know that place," and and it felt exciting in that way. For us, it always felt like, "Oh my god!" Like New York and Movie Land, and you know, it felt sure. all like that. And whenever we go to New York, if we go past like a bakery they used, or a you know, like you could find Carrie Stoop on the on the map and like walk past it or whatever, it's so exciting for us. Uh, but it must be amazing to live there. I hope that you live. Because uh, you are around the age that Carrie was when we first met her, is that fair to say? Um, how old was Carrie when we first met her? I don't. I, think I don't 33? know. Thirty-three. Yeah, yeah. So I'm around that age. Yeah, yeah. It, that's that's very interesting. My goodness. So you're wow. starting out now in New York with your designer labels, with your cosmopolitans, with your fabulous friends, living the dream. And yeah, I'm on the floor of my apartment in sweatpants. So I feel like there are some some real differences between Carrie Bradshaw and me, but look, that's okay. I don't know where your Harry is or your Aiden, but do you know what I do know? He's what? not on the floor of your apartment. So you got to get your fabulous clothes on and you got to get out the door because you're going to meet him out there, not in here. Okay, okay. I really just want to meet a jazz man. I think that's my next adventure. <laughs> Oh, the jazz man was awful, scatting all the time and like. I know, I know, but but it was Craig Bierko. He's a wonderful actor, so he can listen. He can, he'd be good for a fling. He was great for a fling. It was the best sex she'd ever had. She remember she had all those explosive orgasms, the best orgasm yeah. of her life. Go yeah, out there yeah, and yeah. find him right now. Okay. Uh, we wish you well. Go to a jazz club tonight, <laughs> and please report back. Thank you so much that. for joining us, Alex. Oh, and I can't wait you. to see summoning Sylvia when it comes out and rewatch Indoor Boys. When I'm done rewatching Sex and the City, because I'll, you know, I'll need, I'll need another uh, enjoyable uh, place to go. Alex, do you have anything else you want to plug? Can we follow you anywhere on on socials? No, don't follow me on any social media. It's just a losing game. You're really funny on Twitter, though. No, how not they, anymore. Not anymore. I don't really I, have I mean, anything to plug. I honestly don't. We we did the movie. We did Indoor Voice. It's okay. Okay, find Indoor Boys at IndoorBoys.tv. Is that right? Yeah. Or you can watch it on a streaming service. Yeah, it's on uh, it's on some things, but just yeah, go to indoorboys.tv and it's on here TV and it's on uh, on Tubi and it's on some other things. But uh, easiest is indoorboys.tv and something right. Sylvia's Don't coming out this year. Yay! Yay. Can't <laughs> wait to see it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. You have, as always, been a gem and a pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. I just love you. Thank you for having me. 
You're my very own Stanford. Please don't die. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. Thank you. You're you're much cooler than Stanford, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. You have been listening to the Guilty Feminist Watchers and Just Like That with me, Deborah Francis White, and my very special guest, Alex Wise. The producer for the Spontaneity Shop was Tom Selinsky. The Guilty Feminist is part of the ACAST Creator Network. And Just Like That is on HBO Max in the United States and Sky Comedy and now in the UK. Join us next time for episode nine No Strings Attached.